All right, we got room at plenty of tables. I tell you what, I want you to keep talking, but um, I want you to hang on to talk for like 60 seconds so I can give you some directions. So if you can hear me on three, say shh, one, two, three. Shh. I love that that works. That is so great. So thanks for doing that. Um, I do want to kick off this tonight. I want to pray, but then I want to give you one discussion piece around your table for about three or four minutes. And then we are going to dive into, and it starts on page 74, and going to finish out the last two sections here. And uh, we got a really cool thing to hand out as well. So while you're discussing this, you're going to get what I, I call the man card. I've always heard that, hey, don't do that, or you got to turn in your man card, or this, that, or the other. So um, the first time we did this, I put a card together. Nobody told me there were like three or four misspelled words on it, so I redid it. And it basically has a summary of the last four weeks as well as it's got the uh, Theodore Roosevelt man in the arena quote on the back. Um, I use this as a bookmark in my Bible. Uh, I know guys that keep it in their car, and I've had several people go, man, I look at that thing probably once a week and just just use it as a, as a reference point. So it's really, really cool. They're going to give you one for everybody at your table and or if you know somebody who's not here that has been here or would benefit, just say, hey, can I get an extra one for them, okay? So let me pray. I'll give you the question, and then they'll give you a hand out the man cards. I'm going to have you use these tonight as well. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for those who have been here the whole time. Thanks for those who are here just tonight. And, Lord, what a great week to, to be here to get the full uh, overview on it. But, Lord, just thank you for this opportunity, this place to meet, and uh, a chance to just sharpen one another. Lord, speak to our hearts through your truth and the way you made us, and help us be the man you created us to be. And we love you. In Christ's name, amen. So here's the question right out of the gate. As you get the man cards, you can reference them. And the question is twofold. One, if you did watch Cinderella Man between last week and this week, what was a scene that stuck out to you? Or what has been one of the pieces that sticks out or has stuck out to you from the last three weeks? And again, there's a review on the card here. And if you've not been here, Yours is to just get, you get to listen and get the feedback and, and have a good time with it. So you got about four or five minutes to discuss that, get the man cards, and we're going to get kicked in about five minutes. Ready, go. So go. All right, guys, I want you to do this. I want you to grab your man card here a second, and I'm going to do a broad stroke overview on it. But as you go through, I, can I just say that every time I've come up here, and I can't even remember how many times I've been here, we've done two a year for several years, and every time I think, man, I look forward to seeing those guys, and I look forward to going through something different and new or whatnot, but every time, it is a challenge, it's encouragement, it's a validation, it's, it's just a throwdown every time I'm around guys looking at truth, looking at where we need to be, and and this time was no different. That first part, that as men were creating God's images to create and cultivate. I'd been in kind of a rut with a lot of different parts of my, my work and my business. And I thought, you know what? What am I creating? What am I cultivating? Or have I just taken a back seat and, and passively sat back? And then when we look at those that we were designed to reject passivity, accept responsibility, lead courageously, invest eternally, it was really a reminder that, you know what, if there's some unsettled part, or if I feel unsettled or feel like I'm in a rut, which one of these am I violating, so to speak, or which one am I not really embodying? And that really jolted me out. But here's what I want to do in this next couple minutes. I want you to get a pen from your table, and I want you to write down, as we go through this overview of the four different faces, um, I'm going to do a quick review of the last two, and then we're going to hit the lover and the friend one. I want you to personally write down what you feel an adjective to describe that face is. And I'll give you an example with the first one as I read through it. And on page 74, I under, underlined several different pieces of this part. And you can underline them there, but I want to end up with those four words and a word or two under each of them so that when we glance back, and we can look and say, you know what, do I have the king's face on and what does that mean? And in the last sessions, we unpacked two of those faces. The king's face creates order and provision, the first dot. It provides direction. It leads with integrity. It allows us to be a blessing to those entrusted to our care. 
And then it talks about the warrior's face, shows our courageous energy. It demands us to be purposefully and take purposeful initiative. And a man who wears a warrior face is a man of action. And in this session, we're going to look at two others. But I would just take a session, a second and look at those. When I think of the king face, I think of responsibility and integrity. That's what I have under mind. But you may have something else, write something else more personal to you. But just put something under the king face. And then under the warrior one, I've got initiative and, uh, and, and protection. That was one that just kind of came to my mind. I'm, I'm to protect my family and protect those around me and be a protector with those other guys around me. And those were the ones under mine. You can put whatever you want under that. Under number two, in this session, we're going to look at the lover face and the friend face. And these faces, and this is where we start filling in the blanks, and, and you're going to be able to go back and forth between these. But these faces stretch our relational capacity and can be unnatural for many men. In other words, it's not my first move, if you will. And then it goes into a great example of that many men suffer from stunted or reduced masculinity because they've never valued or learned to navigate our own hearts and our own feelings and our own emotions. And can I, I can say that I was absolutely in that boat for a long time. I, I didn't know how to really express that. Am I supposed to express it? If so, where, how, when, and that. And it's been a, it's been a journey that's been really great to understand that. And this next line really kind of gets it. Relational capacity requires men to engage emotionally. And I know it's not natural for all of us. Um, I, the best example I can give, I gave it, I think, five or six years ago when we did this first time. We're in a small group, and I really pride myself on, on staying stay even keel. And my wife was in a small group. You know, she said, Ken never gets his feelings hurt. And I was ready. I literally almost said, well, thank you. I, you know, I really work on that. And then she finished. She says, because Ken has no feelings. And I was like, okay, I think that might have hurt my feelings, but I'm not sure. So to, to move from that to where I can really get it, and, and this is a great passage Paul is writing in 1 Thessalonians where he just talks about that, that scenario and that relationship. Instead, we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. In other words, he's setting an example as a man saying we, we want to put on this face. And um, you go down a little bit further. He says, surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We're actually working. We work night and day in order to not be a burden to anyone while we preach the good news. In other words, we, we really were emotionally invested in you guys. We're, we're not here just to tell you the good news. We're here to live it. And I love what Stu Weber said. He says, whether on the football field, in the battle zone, or under the roof of your own house, a man's willingness to show affection and care Two, and here's the word, connect. Mark him as a leader and a man of God. Am I willing to connect? And I think that's the pivotal word in this face. So the lover face, showing a tender care, these two faces are really about connecting. And if we can think of that as the key, it, it, gets, it, it gives a lot of clarity to what it really looks like. So look at the top of the next page. The lover face is primarily associated with tender care for those, for others. In other words, it's being selfless and willingness to be emotionally vulnerable. And I love this first one. The lover face reflects relational energy. It is characterized by tenderness, sensitivity, Beneficial care, emotional openness, physical affection, and verbal communication. That may be one of the ones you want to put under the lover face on your man card. Which one of those sticks out? Or it may be one of these bullet points um, it, because it may trigger a word from one of these. Pick up on your wife's real needs. I think last week we talked about, um, Jordan Peterson mentioned that when a woman is frustrated and, and she's troubled and we just want to fix it. What we need to do is step back and diagnose what it is because there's a really good chance she doesn't even know what's frustrating her. And to listen to that until we get there and then to work on the solution to it. Uh, together time with our wife. Therefore, our families connect on an emotional level. Be a student of our kids to say, I love you. I'm proud of you. You're special. And I don't know where you were or are in that 
I don't want you to raise your hands, but I, I vividly remember my dad was home. He was an engineer. He provided. He was, he was there for us. But my dad, I never once in my life heard him say, I love you. And I heard him say, I'm proud of you one time. Now, I know he was. He just didn't know how to show that. But a, a man is, is really fulfilled when we get to the point where we know the proper way to be emotional and give our kids permission. And, and I, lo- I love doing that with my boys because they'd get a stiff upper lip and I would say, hey, you know, it's, it's okay to cry in this situation. Men cry when they get hurt like this. This is okay. And I would tell them, you know what? This is not something you cry about. And, and I never had that direction. I just heard the, you know, suck it up, don't cry, rub some dirt on it. And I'm like, yeah, but I just broke my collarbone, you know. And, and it, it, <laughs> I don't think dirt's going to help that right now. But, but that balance there, and we'll get into the balance in a second. Um, examples of the warrior who wear the lover's face. Uh, there's a great story from the U.S. Major Sullivan in the, in the book here. You can look at King David's life. Um, but I want to see the two extremes on this, and that is the caricatures of the lover's face. If a man's lover's face pushes too far, he can show love, quote unquote, by becoming critical, harsh, demanding of his wife and kids. This is the micromanager. When that happens, um, a cold and withdrawal man will be disconnected, dis- detached, and isolated. On the other end, if the man's lover face is pushed too far, he can also become over-dependent on a woman's relation, woman and or relationships in general, and be over-sensitive. And that's where God wants us to really kind of be a balance in that. So on the top of the next page, we look at the friend's face, but on on the lover's face, and in the, in the friend's face, but specifically the lover face, I wanted to just give an example of that. I want us to be men who have it. It. And, and the, what I mean by it, it is an acronym, but I've noticed this. Every woman that I've ever met, they have this in common. They don't have the same personalities. They don't have the same interactions. They don't have the same love languages. They don't have the same anything, but every woman I've ever met has the same comment. They want to be pursued, okay? So the I in in it is to be a man who takes initiative. It's initiative. We've seen it pop up over and over and over in this part. I would even say find a part on the card and just write the word it, because not only it, but I'll give you the T in a minute, but just to have that that initiative mindset in whatever it is, becoming one of these qualities, putting on these faces, but women love to be pursued. Secondly, I noticed this in my wife big time, and it is part of her love language, but women also spell love differently, especially the longer we're with them. Women spell love, T-I-M-E, time. And if we initiate taking time, with them, we become, we've, we've got it. We are, we are it. And I saw this this past weekend with my wife. Um, October's the second busiest month of my year. I've been in and out of town a lot. I make an effort for when I am in town, hey, let's go out. Let's do a movie. Let's do dinner. She wants to get with friends. I, I initiate those pieces. But she's just like, man, I just, this past week, she's like, I'm just, I'm bombed. You're going to be gone all weekend again. I'm like, I know. I said, you ought to come with me. She goes, but I, I, you know, I got to finish school. But, you know, it's conference week, so I get out early on Friday, and I realize I didn't have to be at a show in North Carolina till that evening. And I'm like, well, we can leave. Or I even went so far as saying, you know what, I've arranged with our son. He's going to fly you up there, and I'm going to pick you up, and you can be and you can drive back with me. And just that initiative telling you it's a click and to have that time she ended up riding up with me because she got out early enough but just spending that time it was not great time I was working the whole time but to see her just blossom because we were doing this together 
is huge. So it can be ITT because the other piece is together. Be an it guy is not only taking initiative to spend time, but to do it together. And you can't spend time with somebody if you're not together. But uh, so you can put time or together as your T on that. So with that, we'll move on to the friend face, and then we're going to talk about all the faces. But I would encourage you, think about what piece do I want to put under the lover face as my adjective. The friend face on page 76. The friend face is primarily associated with a man's relational capacity to connect with other men. The friend face reflects connecting energy. It's characterized by loyalty, accountability, encouragement, challenge, and I would encourage you to underline this last word, fun. Fun. Number three is where we fill in the blank, and it's one of the words we're going to hear over and over. We must learn to initiate genuine friendships with other men. Great friendships provide companions who carry burdens and celebrate life's greatest moments with us. That initiative uh, about, gosh, it's been seven or eight years ago. One of my best friends had moved away. Um, and I just realized, man, I don't really have any guys I'm hanging out with at all. And so I went through and I prayed, Lord, will you just show me guys that are close by or whatever? I had a roommate that I hadn't seen in a while, and I had one guy from another group. I, I thought, you know what, he's, he's a great guy. We connected when we do see each other. And then um, I thought about a couple other guys. I called all four of them. I said, hey, um, I haven't talked to you in a while, but uh, and I left a voicemail with all of them. I said, but... Uh, I would love to grab breakfast or lunch sometime. And we did. We set it up. We had breakfast or lunch. What I was stunned, every one of them was like, so is everything okay? And I'm like, yeah, it's fine. I just don't have guys I'm hanging out with, and I haven't seen you, and I would just love to hear how you're doing. Every one of them, to a man, is like, you know what? Me too. I, I, I just don't have that. I mean, I have acquaintances at work, in the neighborhood, at school, or whatever, but I don't really have anybody to, 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 I'm just hanging out with. And so I became a regular breakfast with one of them, got involved in a sport with another one, and connected, and we're connecting every week, every two weeks, and it's just a positive connection. But it's not going to happen unless we take the initiative to do it. And when we take the initiative, it changes everything. I want to do this next one because it really is true. You can't climb the mountain of manhood and reach its pinnacle if you are disconnected from other men. This past summer, if October is my busiest month, July is my least busiest. I usually have July off. And there was a uh, building mission trip to Alaska. And I'd never been to Alaska. It was on my bucket list. So I went on this building trip with 19 other guys. And it's a building mission trip. And I am not handy. So I, I'm going up there. I know two of these guys in passing, and that's it. And so I prayed. I'm like, Lord, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do up here. I don't, I'm confused on which end of a hammer to hold a lot of times. So here's what I prayed. I was like, Lord, will you show me one of the jobs nobody else wants to do? Because that's what I'll do. And I'm telling you, the first meeting, we get up to Anchorage. We have this great day seeing some of the sites, and now we're getting ready to, for the next day to work. And they said, okay, we've got several projects here. Um, one of them, and, and it's one of the bigger ones, but it only needs like six guys. I mean, four guys to feed the insulation of these huge hoppers, but two guys are going to have to actually be in the attic. But don't, don't worry, we have hazmat suits and breathing masks. and I mean, every guy's like... Yeah, I'm not here to risk my life, you know. And he said, we just need two volunteers. And this one guy raises his hand, and they're like, we, well, we need two guys up there. And I'm telling you, everybody's staring at their shoes, and it was crickets. And I'm like, Lord, thank you for making that obvious. I'm like, I'm your huckleberry. I'll be there. And I'm telling you, you spend three days in an attic with another guy in a hazmat suit sweating through everything, you, you, get, you get a little bit of a bonding going there. And the guys who were feeding the stuff up, and it was, it became one of the greatest trips ever. I see these guys now. And when I got back, I've had lunch or dinner with almost every one of them. We see each other at church, and, and we have these in, inside little pieces that we just laugh about. And it's a connection. And I've, I've literally, there's one guy, and, and God just laid him on my heart. He's, 
His wife has um, extreme Alzheimer's. She's in a memory care facility. He goes and visits her, but he's just, and he went on this trip, and he's like, you know what? I just, I don't know anybody because I've just been caring for her. So he and I had lunch, and then one night I said, hey, my wife had told me, uh, she goes, hey, I got tickets for the ABBA concert, the ABBA tribute band. And she goes, Kennedy and I are going, you want to go? And I was like, do you want an honest answer? Or do you just, and she's like, uh, she says, you know, I just don't think you're going to enjoy it. And I'm like, well, you would be correct. I mean, I'll go if you want me to, but it really sounds more like a mother-daughter chick thing. And she goes, oh, it is. And I said, I said, give it to your friend, take somebody. So I called this guy. I said, hey, the Braves are playing, and the Falcons are in preseason, and I thought we would go to Taco Mac and watch some, watch part of the game and grab some wings. He goes, man, that'd be awesome. And what I did is I sent out a text to the Alaska group. I said, hey, me and Jim, we're going to, to Taco Mac. If you want to join us, you're welcome to. And this is the funny part to me. At 4.30 that day, it was me and him. By 6.15, we had 19 people showing up, guys with their wives and their kids, and not every guy made it, but we had this long table out on the patio. God worked it out to where we could all sit together, and the sentiment was the same. Why don't we do this more? Why, why are we not doing this more? So we've had lunches and stuff, but just that connection of we're having fun. I wanted to see the pregame. I wanted to see the Braves. They were in a, in a series, and I'm like, this, this is just fun, and it was just really good. So that's that connection, but it's not going to happen, and we're not going to be completely fulled unless we take the initiative to do that. There's a couple of great verses here, and uh, when, you, when you see a great verse that goes along with your manhood, I would encourage you, write it on your man card somewhere. Just put the reference down. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. I have a younger brother, and I thought that verse meant is born to cause adversity until later in life, and I realized it was born for a time of adversity. And Dawson and I were talking beforehand. Um, he's, he's going through a rough time. He says, I've been blown away at the number of people who have stepped up. And just encouraged me and helped me and prayed for me. And, and I remember having my heart surgery and people came out of the woodworks. And I'm like, wow. I had no idea how, how important that was. Uh, Proverbs 27, 17, probably one of the greatest men verse ever. Iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. Biblical soul level friendships are priceless. They do require time and they require us to be, follow this one, others centered. We have to move from being a little more selfless and a little more self, um, a little more, little less selfish, a little more selfless. And let's look at the two faces of this. If a man's friendship face is pushed too far, he can become dependent on those around him and become a leech so that it's not a mutually beneficial, but a drain. And I know none of us want to become that, but that can be it. If a man does not have enough of the friend face, then he can get a typical friendless, disconnected male. He can be a loner. So pursue character-shaping friendships. Be around guys who are just, they, they have similar interest, at the similar stage in life. And in a second, we'll look at being around guys who are at different stages in life. So with that, I want to just take a couple, couple minutes and discuss this. Uh, wise is the man who can learn to wear these different faces of manhood. You cannot fully embrace the four faces of manhood unless you first embrace a right relationship with God and the provision he has made for us through Christ. Once we meet the ultimate man, we're ready to start going, okay, this is where I need to be. So here's what we're going to discuss. One, did you identify more with the lover face or the friend face? Which one comes easier for you? Secondly, rank yourself on how emotionally engaged and actively engaged you are at home with your wife and kids, if you have wife and kids. And then finish this statement from your wife or kid's perspective. I wish he would be more blank. Okay, that's if you have a home situation like that. And I would encourage you, if you're not married or you don't have kids, listen intently. Make notes because it's going to be the same when you get there. 
and um, ask questions of the guys there. So talk through those. you got about seven minutes to do this, so you're going to have to go a little expedient. If you don't get all the questions, that's okay. But if you do, even better. So seven minutes, go. All right, let me, uh, let me give you a quick... Uh, input. One, if you don't have anything written under your, your faces, go back and look through it and see which words you would do that. But I want to draw your attention. There's a great, on page 82, there's a really cool story about what guys need. Um, and it, it's shaped around some really, really cool ideas. But on page 85, it, where it says road trip, I would just encourage you you can read through those, not because you need to do these, but to just give some ideas. I love the barbecue tour, the idea of just going with others and doing a barbecue tour. Um, hike the Appalachian Trail. It's 2,100 2,181 miles. So, you know, take a long weekend. Do that. Um, <laughs> but whatever it, whatever it is, think about what would you really enjoy? What would you enjoy? And I want to challenge you to pray about Lord, I would love to do this. Will you bring some guys or a guy across my path that would love to do it too and then plan on it and just do it? My boys, we love basketball and we love March Madness. We thought, oh my gosh, what can we do? Now, my oldest is now married. My other one is, is a pilot, so it's a little challenging. We've got to be intentional to get together if it's going to be the three of us. And so Murphy, North Carolina has an Indian reservation and it's probably about three and a half hours from our house. And we decided we're going to go up, we're going to watch the first night, the first round of the NCAA tournament at this Cherokee Casino. And, and Dad's paying for the rooms and the food, and we each took 20 bucks, and we said, okay. We're, it, we had a blast just watching that together. Uh, we've done that with the Final Four as well, where we actually went to the Final Four, got opened up a door, but it was such a great time. And I've got friends now, I listen Who's your team? I got one of my best friends found out he's a huge FSU fan. They're having a great season. And two weeks ago, I'm like, dude, I'm in town. Where are you watching the game? He goes, oh, I don't really, didn't really play on I'm just going to watch it at home. Or home. Well, let's get together. Our wives love each other. Let's watch the game together. And to take something we enjoy and start connecting with others with it is huge. So I would encourage you, plan and think about where we can do that. So we're going to jump into it. Oh, and the Philip Rivers story is really cool as well. It's on the next page there. But go ahead and flip over to page 92. We're going to introduce the seasons of life and kind of what goes on there. I want you to be listening for a couple pieces. One, which season are you in? And what season, if you look around the table, are those in that you're sitting with? And we're going to discuss a couple things at the end because the last two, the last two sessions we're talking about the, the man's faces. And let me, let's see. Yeah. Um, so in there, those last two, we talked about the four faces of manhood. Number two there, those on the path of authentic manhood are not only aware of the different situations in their lives, but they are also aware of the different seasons of life and what those will bring about. In, in this next few minutes, we'll look at the stages of a man's life. What should life look like in your 20s, your 40s, your 70s, and beyond? And, and what should we really be focused on there? So the key idea in that next part is to reverse engineering. That's, that's what we're, we're looking at in these next few minutes. We want to reverse in, engineer. In other words, begin with the end in mind. Wherever I am, where do I want to end up? And what we want to do is examine the lives of some godly men that went before us. And we're going to look at that. I want you to write down in the margins there just the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. And you can write down the word Boaz, B-O-A-Z. Probably one of the greatest love story examples of a man who wore all four of those faces in a great way. And it's a really short book. of the Bible. You can read it in less than 20 minutes. But it's such a great example of those four faces. We're also going to look at the power of mentorship. Men who have already experienced the season that we're in right now. And we're going to talk just a little bit about anticipating transitions. 
it's wise to plan major transitions. It's kind of the law of the harvest. We reap what we sow, and if we have in mind what we want to reap, we got to sow the right pieces. So we reap what we sow. Um, we reap more than we sow, and we reap in a different season than when we sow. So let's just look at a couple of the, the seasons here and be thinking about where am I in right now and what does this look like? So the first one is the spring of life. It's the season of a man comes to terms with his identity. Who am I? The key to this stage is transitioning into adulthood well. Zero to 20, I got to tell you, I love coaching middle school basketball. I love it. Middle school boys are weird. They're not kids. They're not men. They're just all over the place. But in sports, they're never more attentive than they are at that point. My wife teaches middle school. And a couple of her co-teachers at the school where I coached, they came to a practice and they were just like, how do you get them this organized to do this? I mean, I spend all day just trying to get their attention. I'm like, it's an easy phrase. Learn it. And they're like, what, what do you mean? And I said, if they're going crazy, they're not listening, they're not doing what I'm, I'm asking them to do, I, I encourage them, I'll discipline them with running, but here's the phrase I'll use. I'll stop and I'll say, get on the line, get on the, on the, the baseline. Guys, I know that you're young and you're kind of transitioning to – from being boys to men. Let me just tell you, what you're doing right now, that's what boys do, and that's natural. I get it. That's where you are. But if you're going to be a man, this is what you're going to do. So we're going to run a gut drill or suicide. You can't say suicide anymore. We're going to run a gut drill, and then you're going to come back, and you're going to prove to me through your actions whether you really want to be a man or you just want to be boys and play around and have recess. It's up to you. Ready, go. And then they run. And, and, boy, I'm telling you, within two or three practices, these guys are just, I'm, I'm going to be a man. I'm not going to be a boy. I'm going to be a man. And just speaking into them is one of my favorite pieces. So the key questions of these stages is this, who am I and who am I not? What are my talents? What are my limitations? What can I do? What can't I do? And during that time, we really start to learn those. We can go from, I'm going to be a professional athlete to realizing, wait a minute, those guys have talent, and I don't really have that. So maybe I wasn't meant to be that, but I can still enjoy that. The second one is the summer of life. That's 20 to 40, learning and growing. The potential dangers of your 20s, getting lost in extended adolescence is not an option for authentic manhood. Learning to handle sexual energy is a must. I heard the general idea of this, but I taught this to my sons when they started getting to that point. I said, guys, uh, what have you heard about sex? And, and I love their answer. Well, I, not a lot. I mean, I, I got a friend at school. I guess I could ask him. And I was like, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm asking. I said, you need to ask me anything you want, and I'll give you a straight answer. I said, but here's the basics of it. We went camping once, and I said, what, what would happen? I said, do you remember we made that campfire? They're like, yeah. I said, what did I tell you to do? I said, go get sticks. I said, yeah, go get sticks. And we need a couple bigs. We need them all sizes. We put them in the fire pit. And we started the fire. We, we cooked, and it got colder. We stayed warm. And they're like, yeah. I said, what would have happened instead of saying, hey, go get sticks, and put them in the fire pit here, this fire ring, and do that. What if I just gave you matches? And I said, hey, go light some sticks. What would have happened? They're like, we're going to burn the forest down. I'm like, yeah. I said, because in this ring, it, it, it provides warmth, it cooks food, and it provides for us. But outside that ring, it destroys everything it touches. I said, that's what sex is. I said, God made it for this ring, and it is fantastic in this ring. Outside, it's going to hurt you and burn you and destroy you if you don't get a, a hold on it. And I'm telling you, that just, they were like, wow, 
they st- they bring that up to me. Go, man, I, I never forgot that. I told my friends about that. I'm like, well, good, because we've got to get a handle on that. Um, in in major opportunities in our 20s, the major opportunity for us in our 20s is to learn, and then learn, and then learn, learn and learn. What do I want out of life? Where am I distinguishing myself professionally? How am I different from my parents in a good way? And where am I different that I need to change? What do I really believe? What skills do I need to develop? And I, that, the best example I have of that, and it's really one that is more as caught than taught, is just financially. My, my boys are really rooted in a good mindset financially, and they're really struggling with it right now. But they've had that mark, and they're asking that question, what am I going to be like that? Around what person or convictions will I organize my life? The major opportunities of the 30s is growth. Am I going to figure out what my priorities are? Or am I going to develop bad habits? Am I going to be a workaholic? Am I going to be disconnected or connected? Am I going to be balanced? That is where life really happens to find that balance. A key word, and I love this, and underline that last word, the key word to remember during our 30s is margin. Margin. Without margin, relationships are compromised. Good friend of mine, Steve Woods out in Arizona, when we were at this stage, he told me about a buddy who was mentoring him. And he says, I've got kids, I'm helping assistant coach, and I'm, he's running a major multi-million dollar business, and he's traveling and doing all this. And his mentor, he said, you know, Steve, there's three questions to ask anytime an opportunity comes up. Is it the right thing? Is it the right amount of time? Is it the right time, amount of time, and is it the right purpose? He says, if you can answer those, is it the right energy, right amount of energy, the right thing to do at the right time? He says, if it answers all three of those correctly, well, it's going to take this much energy or investment. It's going to be at this time, and it's going to be the right thing. Then do it. He says, don't get stuck to a schedule. Don't get stuck to something. But just ask those questions. He, he's talking about his daughter's softball game. Was it the right thing? Absolutely. I want to support her. Well, what time is it? Is there a major conflict? Well, no. And is it the right amount of energy? It's going to take about an hour and a half. Yeah. Then it doesn't matter. Do it. If it's the right thing, the right amount of time, and the right energy. That stuck with me. and It was huge. Key questions of our 30s. How do I prioritize the demands made on my life? How do I prioritize it? Have I allowed enough time for the spiritual life and authentic relationships? And then we get older, 40s to 60s. There can be a great harvest in this season. Great questions to be asking this time. Have I achieved everything I've wanted to? Do I have dreams that are unfulfilled? Can my mistakes be redeemed? Are my accomplishments fulfilling? Major danger of this season is a midlife crisis. Unfulfilled dreams, regrets that can't be corrected, escape, and an attempt to relive our youth, to go backwards, and that's a Big danger. The major opportunity of the season can be summed up in one word, influence. Underline that word. David Levinson calls this time of life the dominant generation. This is when we can really make an impact in life. And then the winter, 60 and beyond, it's marked by wisdom experience and respect. The greatest danger of this season is for men to buy the lie that he can do no longer contribute. I've got nothing else to contribute. I, I've done all I can do. The major opportunity of this season can take advantage of your flexibility. 
So here's the reality of seasons. Regardless of the season of life we're in, as men, we are called to create and cultivate, no matter what part of life we're in, not just in a particular season, but our entire life. We are called to follow the example of Christ who poured into those guys, and we are created to live a life of truth, passion, and purpose. So no matter what level we're at, it is the middle part of this. Reject passivity, accept responsibility, lead courageously, and invest eternally, no matter what stage of life it is. So in in this discussion time, and then we're going to come back, and I'm going to wrap up with one more example and then we're going to have uh, something. Okay, John, I thought it was something else. But anyway, um, so talk about these questions. You've got about seven to ten minutes. What season of life are you in currently? Mention that spring, summer, winter, fall, winter. I'm sorry, spring, summer, fall, or winter. Don't just jump to being over 60. Go ahead and enjoy the 40 to 60 part. As mentioned in the session, the potential dangers do we need to guard against in our current season? Look at the dangers that we just wrote and just identify any of those that you think that are happening in that. And have you engaged a younger and or an older person to help and seek insights from? And out of, four, out of these four weeks, what were some of the most impactful, helpful takeaways? Okay, and you got them on your card. You got your book. Um, that's a lot. So go into, and you can even decide as a, as a table which ones you're going to discuss first. But go through those, and if you only make it through one or two, that's good. And then I will give you a challenge. We'll give you some opportunities, and then we're going to get some pizza, probably throw the game on and just get to hang out a little bit. All right? So you got about seven to ten minutes. Go. All right, guys, you're going to have a few more minutes if you want them to, to finish discussions and questions and whatnot. But I uh, wanted to give you a couple pieces here real quick. One, there is a survey on your table, and we would love for you to fill that out. I'll even put the prerequisite because John really does appreciate you filling them out, that you are not allowed to get pizza until you have filled it out. And you can drop it off on the table right before the pizza stuff here in just a second. Um, but I also want to just encourage you, one of the greatest, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, greatest steps that I have had is when getting involved in an ongoing piece. And there's some really good ongoing pieces as far as other groups, other guys' groups and all. And Drew is kind of working with that. And or if you're just thinking, man, I got questions about some other stuff. Drew is phenomenal. He eats like several times a week. And uh, loves to eat with other guys. So, Drew, come up and share a little bit about kind of what's going on and some other opportunities. And then we will, uh, we will move into turn on the game and, and eat pizza and stuff. Rousing round of applause. That was tremendous. That was, wasn't even a good golf clap. Okay. Uh, so, from here on, uh, it's pretty much just a hang time. Let me just give you a... A challenge, and that is do something. Within the next seven days, do something with something that you learn. Take a step. Maybe it's calling, take an initiative to talk to some guys and go, hey, let's grab lunch. Let's grab breakfast. Maybe it's uh, like Matt and I connected and we went and played golf, and it was just an absolute blast. He introduced me to another friend of his. Out of that, a few years ago, he had just said, hey, you mentioned one time that you and your family went to this, this event or this week where you served and served families that had kids with cancer, and I told him about it. He and his family ended up going there and doing that this past year, and, and we were able to just connect on that level and go, wasn't that a phenomenal? Um, I don't know if I'll go back to Alaska, but I'll never not have a connection with those guys, and I'll get texts randomly during the week about, hey, man, I'm having a tough time at work. Would you just pray for me? I'm like, yeah, let's get lunch again soon or something. And, and I got to echo just what Drew said. You are literally light years ahead of the majority of men on the planet. Just being around other men going, hey, let's talk about life. Because in our society today, there's such a stigma to if you can't completely agree on everything about everything at every turn, don't talk to anybody because you're going to offend everybody and the world will implode and it's just, it's just craziness. So, and yeah, so here's the deal. We're going to try to get the uh, Sunday night game on. There won't be any volume, but watch that. Um, if you'll just put your surveys on the, 
I guess the bar, it's hard to say a bar in church, but the uh, food bar, there's a bunch of pizzas there. There's a cooler full of uh, different kind of beverages, beers and soft drinks and waters and all kinds of stuff. But uh, just hang out, hang out and enjoy it. If there's any specific questions you have about either the groups or life in general or just any questions, um, we're hanging out and hanging in.